I am honored to introduce Susan Page to all of you. Susan is a well-respected and award-winning biographer and journalist who is currently the Washington Bureau Chief of USA Today. Uh, she was the president of the White House Correspondents Association in 2000, and she has appeared as an analyst in many news programs, including PBS NewsHour and Face the Nation. This uh, evening, she's going to talk about her first book, The Matriarch. In this new biography of Barbara Bush, uh, Susan chronicles the life of a, wom of a woman that helped define two presidencies, utilizing hundreds of interviews and many sources, including conversations with Barbara Bush herself and access to her diaries. Susan lays out the life of a woman that was instrumental in the formation of a political era. Uh, she will be in conversation with Diane Rehm, award-winning host of The Diane Rehm Show and On My Mind. Uh, everyone, let us all welcome Susan Page and Diane Rehm. Good evening. I, want, I wanted to start just by uh, thanking you all for coming. Uh, this means that my uh, nightmare that Diane and I would be up here alone uh, did not come to pass, so thanks for being here. I want to thank uh, Politics and Prose, such a wonderful bookstore. I mean, what would we do in Washington without uh, Politics and Prose? So we thank them uh, so much for hosting this event. And finally, I'd like to thank uh, Diane Rehm for uh, agreeing to be in conversation with me at this event. You know, I was thinking as I was coming here, uh, I remember clearly the day in 1993, so it's a quarter of a century ago, when Diane Rehm called me at my office, I was then working for Newsday, and said, would you like to try guest hosting my show? Uh, because Susan King, who had been a guest host, had taken a job in the Clinton administration. And the voice that came out of my mouth said, yes, I'd be honored. And the voice that I heard in my head was, is she crazy? I can't, I can't possibly guest host the Diane Rehm show. Uh, but that experience over the years that followed were among the most valuable things I've done professionally in my life. And Diane Rehm has been such a uh, such a mentor and a teacher and a friend and a shining example. So thank you very much, Diane. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we are here to talk about this. What I have to say is a fabulous biography of Barbara Bush. And there may be, Susan, a number of people who are thinking, why Barbara Bush, and why now? So let me, let me ask you a question first to the audience. So this is Washington, so some of you may raise your hands for this one. How many of you actually knew Barbara Bush, knew her personally? So we, we've, got, we've got some hands that, that came up. Let me ask you another question. Whether you ever met her or not, how many of you feel like you knew Barbara Bush? So in, in covering uh, campaigns in White Houses, I've, I've covered the last 10 presidential elections. It's, it's really my only job skill. Thank, <laughs> thank God they keep holding elections and, so I can be employed. Uh, it, when, when I would go out and talk to voters, they all thought they knew Barbara Bush. And mostly they liked her a lot. And they thought she was warm and grandmotherly and, and authentic. And, and she, was, she was those things. But she was so much more than warm and grandmotherly. She was uh, tough, uh, smart, uh, shrewd. She could be mean. Uh, she was influential in the administrations for both her husband and her son. Uh, she is, in fact, the only person in American history who's had that experience of being the wife of one president and the mother of a president and to be alive at the time her son was in the White House. Abigail Adams' son was also elected president, but she had passed away before he took office. And she was no uh, shrinking violet when it came to either administration. And there are issues in which she played a really crucial role uh, that were have been discounted. I, I really think she has been underestimated throughout her life by her mother and her teachers and her husband and herself. She was a complicated woman, and she suffered more pain and grief in her life than was ever revealed. 
So that is why I thought it would be worthwhile to examine the life of Barbara Bush. Susan, I think that many people saw her as tough. Certainly the press regarded her in that way. But inside this woman, from your research, was about as fragile and as unbelieving in herself as just about any other woman I've read about. Tell me where that came from. So Barbara Bush, uh, Barbara Pierce Bush had a father she adored and who adored her, but she had a really fraught relationship with her mother. And her mother cared uh, a lot about appearances. Uh, she had what her children called enthusiasms. Uh, and her greatest enthusiasm was for Barbara's older sister, Martha. Martha was slender and beautiful. She was so pretty that she worked for a time as a model. She was on the cover of Vogue for the college edition of Vogue when she was in college. Uh, and she had another brother, Jimmy, who was uh, uh, sort of a uh, always in trouble but charming. And she had a, a younger brother, Scott, who was very ill as a child. And so I asked her, tell me about, if you had to characterize you and your siblings when you were growing up, what would you say? And she said, Martha was the pretty one. Jimmy was the Peck's bad boy. Scott was the perfect one. And I said, well, what were you? And she said, I was the little fat one. And that was a view of herself that she had through her whole life. Uh, she was very insecure about her looks. And, you know, she would... She would joke, she would always make a joke about her weight uh, and her white hair. And I think that, and, and that was disarming uh, to people, but I think that there was a germ of truth when she made those jokes. And I think she did it to prevent anyone else from talking about her weight before she had made fun of herself. When you told her or asked her what she thought the book should be <laughs> titled, what did she say? So she didn't like, oh, there's Matt. Can I just introduce one person? There's Matt Latimer, who is, we should have given him a round of applause, but wait till I tell you why. So <laughs> Matt is my agent uh, from Javelin, D.C. Oh, good, he's blushing. I'm glad I've, made, I'm glad I've embarrassed him. And, uh, and this book is, is really the, the product of, the, of Matt's uh, intellect and his enthusiasm and his encouragement and never could have happened without him. And I am greatly in his debt. So thank you, Matt. So Barbara Bush didn't like anything about the title that I had chosen. She didn't like the word matriarch. She didn't like the word dynasty. And so I said to her, well, what would you call this book? And she said, the fat lady sings again. Wow. <laughs> so, but she finally accepted the matriarch. Well, it was my book, so <laughs> she wasn't going to like tell me what to call it. <laughs> But, you know, this is the most intimate portrait of Barbara Bush that anybody could ever imagine. She gave you how many hours, how many sessions, and then, most striking of all, access to the diaries that she had kept for how many years? She started keeping her diaries in 1948. And she made the last entry in her diary 12 days before she died. Wow. But, you know, I signed a, a contract to, um, to write this book, not having contacted her or any of the Bushes beforehand. And this was possibly idiotic. But, <laughs> but here was my reasoning, that if I... I wanted to do the book. I knew I wanted to do the book. If I, call, if I contacted her and she said, I will not cooperate, I would have been greatly discouraged. I don't know if I would have had the confidence to go ahead and try to do it. But if I called her and she said, yes, I'll cooperate, and, if, and you said that before I had actually signed a contract and was on my way, maybe she would think she had some sway over what I wrote. And I didn't want to do an authorized biography. I wanted to do a piece of journalism. 
uh, and independent work. So um, with Matt's help, I signed a contract uh, with a publisher. And then I wrote her a letter and said, I, I will do this book. I, I, I'd interviewed her over the years. I said, I, I am going to do this book, and I hope you'll let me talk to you. And she said that I could come down and interview her in, in Houston. Uh, and we had no great, greater plan than that. So I did the, the first interview. And of course, I didn't at that point know if there would be a second interview. And so this was the fastest talking, most ground covered interview you've ever heard, because I thought it was possibly the only time I would, I would talk to her. She was 92 years old. She must have been exhausted at the end of it. But at the end of it, I said, can I come down and interview you again a second time? And she said, yes. And after the second interview, I said, can I come interview you a third time? And she said, yes. And that went on through five interviews. And we had, in fact, a, a sixth interview scheduled. I had gone to uh, Texas for the sixth interview. Uh, but the, the night before we were going to get together again, she fell. She broke her back. She went into the hospital. And she never recovered again. And the, the very first interview I did with her, she said, do not even bother to ask to see my diaries. You'll never be able to see them. And, uh, and I, that was disappointing, but it wasn't surprising. Because if you'd kept a diary, would you like let a reporter see them? Did possibly, you know? Possibly not. Did you know about oh, yes. the diaries? I, th I knew about the diaries, okay. yes. All right. um, and in the third interview, I asked her, you know, I know I can't see your diaries, but could I see the, the diaries that relate to your relationship with Reza Gorbachev? Because that was something that was really interesting to me and ended up being a chapter in the book. And she said, I'll think about it, which I thought meant no. <laughs> and in the end of the fifth interview, which turned out to be our last interview, although I didn't know it at the time, she, I, was, I stood up to leave and she said, I've decided you can see my diaries, all of them. Wow. And I had the worst possible reaction because I was so stunned. I said, are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> but the, the, the gift of seeing her contemporaneous wow. thoughts, her observations, uh, the, the way she vented in her diary in ways that she couldn't do in public, it was, it was an extraordinary gift. And I've, I've wondered why she turned around on that issue, because I hadn't really lobbied her on it, because I thought it was a closed case. And I think that her health was getting worse and worse as, uh, it, it, at each interview. She was in, in worse, she was in great mental shape, but she was in worse physical shape every time I saw her. And I think she probably knew that she wasn't going to live for another interview. I think she probably knew that that was the last time we were going to see each other. Um, and if she had not given me permission to see her diaries, no one would have been allowed to see them for 35 years wow. under the provisions of the gift that she made uh, of the diaries to the, to the Bush Library. So this was extraordinary. And I think you said earlier her relationship with her mother was so formative, but in fact, perhaps the most affecting time of her life and which dwelt with her for the rest of her life was the death of her child. Talk about that and read for us from that. Chapter. Do you want me to read first or talk first? Whatever. Uh, okay, I'll, re I'll read first. <clears throat> Thank you. So, so Robin was three years old uh, when she was diagnosed with leukemia, a disease that neither George nor Barbara Bush had ever heard of before. And here's a passage that talks about that. 1953. Robin's illness and her death, six brutal months later, would forever change Barbara Bush. The experience would steal her resolve and broaden her understanding of the ways the innocent can be caught and crushed by the unfairness of life. It would leave an indelible stamp on her about what matters and what doesn't. It would cement a bond between her and her firstborn son that would last until Barbara's passing, 
and it would test her marriage. George's and Barbara's responses to Robin's illness and eventual death would forge a template that they would follow through the ebbs and flows of their long union. Barbara was a strong one during Robin's painful treatment as George dissolved in tears. With Robin's death, Barbara was the one who collapsed in sorrow, and George became her rock. The pattern of one stepping up when the other was struggling and of being able to switch those roles between them would sustain the couple during times of political defeat and personal pain. It would prove to be crucial decades later when Barbara Bush struggled with depression and again when the elder George Bush was embittered by his defeat for re-election to the White House. But nothing would ever match the heartbreaking struggle that robbed them of any sense of the seasons in 1953. The morning after Robin died, on October 11, 1953, Barbara was shocked when she suddenly noticed that the leaves on the trees in her hometown of Rye in suburban New York were at the peak of their fall colors. The last time she had paid any attention to such things was six months earlier in Midland on that March day. Quote, I remember realizing life went on, she said, whether we were looking or not. And that was, that last sentence, was that from her diary? Or did she say that to you? She said that to me. <laughs> Interesting. The um, outcome of that death, in part, led her to have a far greater sympathy and understanding for those with HIV AIDS and with other diseases that perhaps she would never have thought about previously. And you know, Diane, it took me a while to realize what a stamp this experience had left on her. And when, when I was writing, the, you know, you write a book proposal for publishers. And when I was writing the book proposal, I said the first chapter of the book would be the 1988 campaign, the campaign that put George Bush in the White House, uh, and that the chapter on Robin would come back where it fell chronologically. And when I wrote the first draft of the book, that's exactly what I had done. And it just was wrong. It just felt all wrong. Because the 1968-88 election may have been the defining experience for George H.W. Bush, fulfilling his long ambition to be president, but it was not the defining experience for Barbara Bush. The, the defining moment for Barbara Bush came with Robin's illness, and even and decades later on a variety of issues, it would be the touchstone that she would turn to. When, when Bush went into the White House, the AIDS crisis was raging, and the Reagan administration had not paid enough attention to it. Uh, uh, enough. Yeah. And, Annie. And there was, you know, it's hard, maybe it's hard to remember now the stigma that was attached for people with AIDS. And when Barbara Bush saw that, here's what she saw. She saw the time when Robin was clearly not getting better. They'd taken her to New York to Sloan Kettering for treatment. George Bush's uncle was a doctor there um, and urged them to come there for cutting edge treatment, although no one had ever survived leukemia before. There was no case of leukemia being cured at that point. And Robin underwent uh, very difficult and painful treatments. They decided to take her home to Midland for one last visit so that she could see her two brothers and neighbors and the Bushes could see their friends. And when they did that, some of Barbara Bush's closest friends refused to come and visit because they thought leukemia might be catching. And when Barbara Bush looked at what was happening with AIDS patients, that's the lens through which she saw them. Uh, and that's why during the first 100 days of being First Lady, she did something that was extraordinary for the time. She went to Grandma's house, which still exists here in DC, which was a hospice for babies with AIDS. Many of them had been <laughs> abandoned by their parents. And she made a point of picking up a baby named Donovan, a six-month-old uh, boy, and <coughs> hugging him and putting her cheek to his cheek. And she made a point of doing this in front of news cameras because she was sending a message that you couldn't get AIDS by picking up a baby. 
And she then went into a, a private meeting with some adults who had AIDS. And this was close to the press. And one of the men who was in this meeting, Lou Toscani, said to her, you know, people think babies are blameless, but they don't think that of us. We need a hug, too. And in this private meeting, Barbara Bush said, I'll give you a hug. And in fact, they embraced. And then when they went out to where the news cameras were, she made a point of giving him a hug again so that there would be pictures of it that would be transmitted that would say also, adults with AIDS need acceptance, an embrace, a hug, too. And t two years later, Lou Toscani was dying in the hospital of AIDS, and he was having a very tough time of it. And a friend of his who worked on the Hill called Barbara Bush's office, didn't have a name, cold called the White House, to ask to talk to Barbara Bush's office, got Anna Perez on the phone, who was then Barbara Bush's press secretary. And he said, you know, I have a friend, uh, and he was sure he would have a very difficult time getting through. He said, I have a friend who met with Barbara Bush when she visited uh, Grandma's house, and Anna said, oh, Lou Toscani. That's how much this visit had meant to Barbara Bush and the people in her office. And he told her that Lou was dying and in his final days and having a tough time. And Barbara Bush wrote him a handwritten note, a handwritten letter that said, Lou, I'm thinking of you. Your life has meaning. Your life has value. You've made a difference. And his friend told me that this made all the difference for Lou in the final days of his life. And there was Barbara Bush being strong, being resolute, and yet there was a time in her own life when she became almost suicidal. Why? It was 1976. Um, the Bushes had just come back from China, uh, where he had been the top U.S. diplomat there. He had taken a job to head the CIA, a job his wife told him don't take, because what he really wanted to do was be president, and she thought that was not exactly a natural path to the presidency to head the CIA. <laughs> but he took the job anyway. And of course, it's a job that you can't come home and tell your spouse all about what you learned that day. As she said, you know, I couldn't keep a secret. I would keep it for a day, and then I'd tell somebody. So after, after decades of playing a big part in, in her husband's life, in his professional life, she, she wasn't anymore because she had an empty nest at home. Her kids were all either away at school or starting life as, as young adults. She was going through menopause. She thinks that might have had uh, uh, an impact. But at the time, she didn't have this insight into what was going on in her life. She just fell. All she knew was that she had fallen into a terrible darkness. And she told me that she would be driving and have an impulse to plow into a tree or to steer into the path of an oncoming car, and that she would have to pull over to the side of the road and stop and wait for this impulse to pass. So she was suicidal. And no one, the only person she talked to about it was her husband, who was, she says, supportive, encouraged her to get help. She didn't go to get help. She thought, she did not. She, yes, in retrospect, she thought she wow. should have. But you know, you see the, the impact of this experience later when one of her granddaughters struggled with drug addiction and mental illness. And in reading her, her diaries about her granddaughter, there was never a sense of, why doesn't she straighten out? You know, why doesn't she just have the willpower to do better, to, to stop taking drugs, to, to straighten out her life? I think that reflects her own experiences with knowing that Mental illness is not something you can kind of wish yourself out of with willpower. But it was so at odds with her public image, you know, that public image of being strong and kind of yeah. stoic. And exactly. even when I was working on the book, I talked to her younger brother, Scott, the perfect one, who in fact is an incredibly nice guy. So I can see why he was the perfect one. Um, but he refused to believe that she was seriously suicidal yeah. because that is how much she masked that mm. part that episode in her life. She uh, became one of the most popular first ladies, and yet she was not 
by those arranging all these political campaigns for George H.W. W. Bush, she was not considered an asset. They sort of <laughs> pushed her to the side. So this, you know, I, the, the 1980 campaign was the first campaign I covered. And in fact, George H.W. Bush was the first national politician I ever interviewed. Um, so I covered that campaign. And this was still a surprise to me when I researched this book, that um, the, the campaign was very nervous about Barbara Bush. They thought she looked too old. They were presenting George H.W. Bush as the young leader of a new generation running against Ronald Reagan, who was much older, a generation older than he was. And they worried that Barbara Bush undercut that image because she had white hair. Um, her sister-in-law came to her one day and said that the family had had a, a talk, conversation about what to do about Barr to get her to dye her hair and to lose some weight and to dress snappier is the word that Barbara Bush uh, used with me. And this was, as you can imagine, pretty wounding for Barbara Bush, who already had insecurities about how she looked. And in that campaign, I went back to look at the TV ads that they aired uh, in the first part of the primaries. Um, and they didn't feature Barbara Bush. They didn't show Barbara Bush, even though Bob Dole, who was also doing ads at that time, was doing as it featured Elizabeth Dole uh, as a, you know, in a, yeah. in a as a as a big asset, and in, I looked at some of the campaign flyers that they produced in that campaign, and some of them didn't mention he was married, and in one of them there was a picture of him, and Barbara Bush is standing behind him, looking at him adoringly, but she's not identified. It's not she could have been a stalker, you know? You no, know, who knew who she was? So they were, they were. Uh, you speak of someone being underestimated. She was underestimated as an asset in that first campaign. But by 1988, when he ran for president again, she was one of the more important political advisors, strategists at key moments in that campaign. And by 1992, when he ran for re-election, he was practically trying to ride her coattails back into office. Let's talk about his years as vice president and Barbara's relationship with Nancy Reagan. So, uh, you Pretty know, every, bad. everybody knew that they weren't best pals, right? <laughs> to put it mildly. <laughs> but, but the, but the, uh, the depth of the, or the, uh, the heat of the tension between them was really uh, astounding. And one of the great... Uh, one of my favorite finds in this book is there, those of us of a certain age remember the most glittering event of the, of the Reagan uh, White House, which was the White House dinner for Princess Di and Prince Charles. Do you remember that, where John Travolta danced with Princess yeah, Di? It was like, it was the best ticket you could get in the Reagan White House. And when the Reagan had, White House had state dinners, the Bushes were always included because protocol required including the vice president. But Prince Charles was not a head of state, so this was not a state dinner. And the guest list went to Nancy Reagan of who to invite to this dinner. Uh, for, it went from the social secretary. And the first name was President and Mrs. Reagan, and the second name was Vice President and Mrs. Bush. And Nancy Reagan took her pen and crossed out the Bush's name. How do you know that? Because we found it in the Reagan Library. <sighs> and... And there's a picture of it in the book. Uh, it may be my favorite picture. <laughs> and then in, we, we found subsequent memos, because they, they would, like, every day or two, they would have an updated guest list for this big dinner. And the social secretary would say, suggested names to add, Vice President and Mrs. Bush, and their name would be crossed out again. Finally, Mike Deaver, who was the Deputy White House Chief of Staff and the person who was the... West Wing person closest to Nancy Reagan, um, called her and said, you can't not invite the vice president to this dinner. And she said, just watch me. Whoa. And they were Whoa. not invited Whoa. to the dinner. There have and had long been rumors about George H.W. Bush's relationship with another woman, which 
everybody around them, including the two, denied and denied and denied. What did you find out? So I think it's important to to note just what you did, that George Bush denied it, uh, Barbara Bush denied it, called it a smear. Jennifer Fitzgerald, the woman uh, who was involved in the rumors, denied it the few times that she was asked about it. And that's something we shouldn't forget, that that they denied it. But there were, there was aspects of George Bush's treatment of Jennifer Fitzgerald that fueled these rumors for a decade. Because Jennifer Fitzgerald was first controversial within the staff. She was difficult for others to get along with. Uh, some staffers left the, left the Bush's staff rather than continue to deal with her. Uh, James Baker, who was, of course, Bush's great friend and ally and served him through all these years, in that first campaign in 1980, went to Bush and said, Jennifer goes or I go. And Bush said, I'll think about it. And didn't decide until didn't tell Baker until the next morning that Jennifer would be moved out of the campaign. Uh, she rumors about the relationship became public, and yet Bush continued to keep her on his staff and close by his side. And there are those who believe that they did have an affair, um, and there are those who believe they didn't. Uh, and it was something that came up repeatedly. I ended up writing a fair amount about it. Here's what I know for sure, that whether these rumors were true or not, they were enormously painful for Barbara Bush, who found herself repeatedly in interviews having to address them and deny them. Uh, and so it was, uh, that it was, this was among the things that caused her real uh, anguish during campaigns. One last question, and then we'll invite those of you who'd like to pose your own question to come forward because we want to record your questions as well. This interview is going to be heard on my podcast next Tuesday on my mind dianereem.org <laughs> so you can hear it then but if those of you who would like to ask a question please come forward to these two microphones one last question Susan and I think one that disappointed a great many of us who are pro-choice women it was always believed that Barbara Bush was indeed pro-choice, and yet she kept silent for the sake of her husband. Do you think she was disappointed in herself for having done that? So first, let's, let me, if I may, describe how we know more fully now, uh, what her views on abortion were. So I had access to her diaries, and they, they have not been curated yet. They no, no archivist has gone through them. They're just like boxes of papers in uh, cardboard boxes kept in a locked cage in the Bush Library. And w so having gotten permission to see them, and the, the only other person who had gotten permission to see them was John Meacham, who wrote the wonderful definitive biography of George H.W. Bush, Destiny and Power. He was the only person besides myself who had permission to see them. They'd bring out these boxes and pages would be stuck together and they would be like totally out of order. And it was, uh, it was in a way that made it more difficult, but it made it an incredible uh, journey to go through them. And I'm looking at her diary from 1980. So he's about to make his, he's making his first campaign for the presidency. And I open up the diary, and there are four sheets of paper, yellow, yellowing paper, folded in half, tucked in, a, tucked in the diary. And I pull them out and open it up, and it says at the top, thoughts about abortion, and they're underlined. And what, what it was was it was a letter that Barbara Bush wrote to herself as she tried to figure out what she thought about abortion. She knew she was going to be asked about it on the campaign trail, and she wanted to figure out what she thought. And in this 
on these four pages, there is never a mention of the political calculations surrounding uh, abortion policy. She was looking at it completely as a moral issue. And where she came down was shaped by Robin's death. And here's how she described it in, in her own handwriting and hardly any pa- words marked out. I mean, she was she was writing with some confidence to herself, I think, even as she tried to figure this out. She said, I remember, the, I remember when Robin was born and I felt her soul into her body. And I remember when Robin died and I felt her soul leave her body. And if your soul enters your body at the moment of birth, Abortion is not murder, and therefore it should be left up to mothers and fathers and doctors, and it is not a presidential issue, and she underlined not two or three times. So she came to this conclusion that that was her view on abortion. On the, on the side of the, up the margin on the fourth page, she wrote, needs lots more thought. <laughs> but the fact is she never changed her mind about what she thought about abortion, because she had made a decision based on what she actually felt in her soul. It was a philosophical question, not a political one. But when her husband was running, when her husband became vice president, got on the ticket for, uh, with Ronald Reagan, one of the conditions was that he was going to support the platform. And what that meant was support the Republican platform view on abortion, which was an anti-abortion, an anti-abortion rights position. And Barbara Bush then just stopped talking about it. And I think I understand that you interviewed her, and she just refused to tell you what she Absolutely. thought about it. Absolutely. Yeah. I interviewed her twice. Never said a word. Because she so adored her husband that she did not want to complicate his life. And her view was, it matters what the candidate thinks. It does not matter what the candidate's wife thinks. And I'm not going to create problems for him, and I'm just going to keep my mouth shut. Wow. But she began to talk about it more openly once he was out of office. Yeah. All right. Questions? First. Yeah, if you can speak (laughs) right into that microphone. Hello, Susan and Diane. Big fan of both of you. Thank you. Um, My question is about Barbara Bush's relationship with Bill Clinton. Um, (laughs) It seems really unique that she came to see this man who defeated her husband as one of her adopted sons. So could you talk about her relationship with President Clinton? So, uh, you know, Bill Clinton um, won over George H.W. Bush uh, after they were both out of the White House. They did that tsunami relief trip. Um, Clinton was very deferential to Bush. Bush really liked that. They, they they, They pretty quickly, I think, became... People who had put aside that very bitter 1992 campaign and were friends. Barbara Bush was a little harder to win over um, because she was pretty skeptical of Bill Clinton. Um, She complained that he cheated at golf, which (laughs) was apparently a kind of original sin where she came from. Um, And she was she was never, I think, but she came to believe that the friendship between her husband and Bill Clinton was real. And she came to think, as many others did, that Bill Clinton, whose father died before he was born, saw in George H.W. Bush, at least to some degree, the father he had never had. And she, she respected that. But she, to the last day, had a more dyspeptic view of Bill Clinton than her husband did. Yeah. Over here, please. Hi. Most uh, uh, liberals that I know uh, didn't hold George Sr. in high regard until Jr. came in. Sim- <laughs> similarly, we didn't appreciate Jr. much until the current guy him. came in. <laughs> um, did Barbara express any uh, sense of um, disappointment in her son's presidency? So not disappointment in her son or his presidency, but she had a big difference with him on the war in Iraq. And, you know, when when George W. Bush was elected, his father made a famous promise that he wasn't going to give advice unless he was asked. And George W. almost never asked his father for advice. His mother had not made that promise. (laughs) And she felt pretty free to make advice. And the war in Iraq became a real source of contention between them. And she went to, she would complain to him that 
he was listening to the wrong people. He had he had basically pushed aside Brent Scowcroft, who had been on the Foreign Intelligence Advisory Board, had previously been um, her husband's, had been the first Bush's <coughs> National Security Advisor. He had George W. had pushed him off the Foreign Intelligence Advisory Board. Barbara Bush thought he was paying way too much attention to Dick Cheney and Don Rumsfeld. She told him he was taking the wrong course. And it, he eventually became annoyed by the fact that she kept raising this issue with him. And he, she, he finally said to her, I'm the president. I'm making the decisions, not Dick Cheney or Don Rumsfeld. And basically told her to back off, which I think she did at least to some degree. But it was, I think, the issue on which they had the biggest difference during her son's presidency. I'm going to follow up with that and ask you about her time clock <laughs> for Donald Trump. So this will surprise you. She did not like Donald Trump. <laughs> and uh, she was... She, and she made it pretty clear to, to everybody around her that she didn't like Donald Trump. And in fact, she had this club called the 1925 Club. And it was a group of women, friends in Houston, who went to lunch once a month, who had all been born in 1925. And they were all very, they had let me go to lunch with them once when I was down in Houston. Uh, they were very proud of this club and the name, title of it. And it got, uh, membership got thinner as people died. Uh, so the club, which had originally been pretty good size, was down to a few. They, they voted to let in Anda Grundy, who was born in 1924. This was apparently quite controversial at the time. <laughs> they didn't change the name of the club. But, uh, but anyway, so when I went to lunch with them, they carefully all avoided talking about Trump. And I finally figured out it was because they'd had so many fights about Trump that they had made a kind of a gentleman's agreement not to talk about it over lunch. But in Kenny Bunkport, a friend of hers uh, gave her one of those countdown clocks, Trump countdown clocks that show the days and hours and minutes and seconds until President Trump's first term is over. And she put this on a little bedside table uh, in, in their bedroom in Kenny Bunkport next to a chair where she would sit and she would needlepoint and watch TV. And she liked it so much that when they went back to Houston at the end of the summer, she brought the countdown clock with her. She parked it on the bedside table in Houston, and it was there the day she died. Wow. Question here, please. Yes. Uh, what did you learn about Barbara Bush which most impressed you in terms of her character, number one, and then number two, uh, how do you think she viewed her own role in her husband's uh, presidency or professional life? Because she was a mom, you know, and a wife. You know, there was, a, there was a question I asked. I interviewed more than 100 people whose lives had intersected with Barbara Bush, uh, family members, uh, fr friends and relatives and staffers and people who didn't like her much. Um, and for almost every one of them, I would end the interview and say, now, if, if George Bush had not married Barbara Pierce, would he have become president? So it's an unknowable question, right? You can't rerun history. Um, but what do you think? And so when I asked Barbara Bush that, she said, absolutely, he would have become president if he hadn't married me. And when I asked George Bush that, he thought about it for a minute and he said, yes, I believe I would have. <laughs> <laughs> Which I thought was like, no husband should answer that question that way. But if you're ever asked this question, do not answer, yes, I would have done whatever I did without my wife. And I think that is a sign that they both underestimated her because I think they're both wrong. I think she was indispensable to the success that George Bush had, including, including becoming president. And even James Baker agreed with you. You know, James Baker agreed with me. Um, Brian Mulroney, the, who was then the Canadian prime minister and was the foreign leader closest to Bush, told me he absolutely uh, agreed that he wouldn't, that she was... Uh, critical. And when I asked Bill Clinton this question, he said, absolutely, he wouldn't have become president. And he said, the one thing you have to admire about George H.W. Bush is that he had the guts to marry her. <laughs> because she was, uh, she was a formidable, she was tough, she was formidable, she was fierce. Um, but she was vulnerable. And she had an impact in a positive way um, on AIDS, on cultivating relation with Reza Gorbachev that helped 
the negotiations that ended the Cold War. Um, in, and you know, so I think that I think you had made the point that we all love the Bushes now. Uh, you know, I think this the whatever policy differences people have with uh, with George and Barbara Bush. Um, whatever you think about, and of course he lost his bid for a second term, I think that just about everybody sees them as honorable and decent and well-meaning and people who had the interest of the country and, the, um, and Americans at heart. And I think a lot of people wish we could get back to that time. Indeed. Next question. I'd like to clarify, I don't wish Dick Cheney back, but I would take either Bush. <laughs> um, I uh, thank you, first of all, for being here. Politics and Prose is an awesome location. I live in Northern Virginia, and it's so easy for me to get here for these events. So thank you very much for putting this on your uh, schedule. Um, I spent 27 years in the fire department. I was a firefighter. I retired three years ago. Um, I spent most of that time starved for female mentors. <clears throat> so I guess I'm sort of dovetailing onto the previous question. Um, based on your research, based on what you know now, um, do you consider her a mentor, um, even posthumously? And what would you say, if, as you speak, mostly specifically to the women in this room or to my 20-year-old daughter, what did you learn from this that you would tell them they should emulate in their own life? Well, first of all, thank you for your service uh, at the fire department. I have to say that my mentor is sitting right here. Uh, uh, but, you know, Barbara Bush had a very interesting... Um, attitude toward feminism. Uh, and it was complicated. And I, I thought of her as a feminist because she was strong-minded. She had her own opinions. She didn't mind expressing them. She, you know, she was no wilting flower. Um, but in a, one extended conversation we had about this, she refused to say she was a feminist. And, um, and I said, well, why? What is it about feminism that, that you don't accept? And, and she, she to kind of talked around it, and I, and I finally gave up. I, I said, you're really being slippery on this. And she said, yes, I am, like, <laughs> quite proudly. Um, you know, I think she felt dissed by feminists. I think that when the feminist movement, when the women's movement began in the, in the 70s and 80s, uh, I think that she felt the life choices she had made were being devalued. Um, you know, I went back and looked at Here's another thing I'd forgotten about. I went back and looked at uh, how she was portrayed. And Saturday Night Live did skits about making fun of Barbara Bush, having Phil Hartman portray her in drag. Yeah. So it was the most insulting possible depiction of her, right? Wow. And goes right to something she worried about herself. And they had one skit where they have a very uh, attractive uh, actress playing Elizabeth Dole. And, they're, and, the, and the, they're praising Elizabeth Dole. Oh, you've done this, and you've done that, and you've done this. You're so wonderful. You're Wonder Woman. And then they turn to the Barbara Bush character, and they say, we understand you're making a rug. Which wow. she, was, she was, in fact, needlepointing a rug. It took her eight wow. years to do it. Wow. And I said, did that hurt your feelings? And she said, no, and you're sitting on the rug. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for being here today. Um, I'm a teacher, and I have two questions for you. Uh, my first question is, I've seen several interviews with Barbara Bush, and I, what, I gained, what I gathered most from those were the fact that she was so hysterically funny. And I, whenever I see her talk, I can't stop laughing. So what is the funniest story that she told you? And the other question I have is, what, I'm not quite sure how to ask it, but what, in terms of what you saw, do you think was the secret that let their marriage last so long and become so successful? Mm. So thank you for your service as a teacher. Um, you know, I think they were complementary. They weren't the same. They were pretty different. And she could be pretty sharp, but he could be a little soft. And so there were times when, I, so I think they were, I think that's what made their marriage so strong. They, they, they fit each other well. Um, there were times when she, there were some critical points politically where she encouraged him to run some tough ads that he was reluctant to run. And he ran them after she said famously, I think it will be all right, George, after he had d refused to be swayed by the political strategist advising him. And those were important in his political success. Whether you think those ads were a good thing to do or not, they contributed to his success. But she also 
uh, he also softened some of her edges. And maybe you know couples that are like that, uh, where one they each make the other better. Um, there was one point where um, her father had died, and her and Scott, the perfect brother, was helping to support their stepmother, who nobody in the family had really gotten along with. And he called his sister Barbara to ask if she would help him, you know, ba- give, send some money to help support this stepmother that that neither of them really liked because their father had passed away and he felt it was their responsibility. And she said no one hung up. (laughs) And Scott told me that a few minutes later the phone rang and it was George saying, "Never, no, Barbara gave you the wrong answer. Yes, we'll send you some money. So we should all hope for partners like that, right, that make us better in the places where we're not as good. (laughs) And I think the funniest thing she um, said was the the fat lady sings again. And it was just like not a question she could have expected, I think. And it was just like immediate. Absolutely. (laughs) Please. Um, Hello. Um, I understand that Barbara Bush uh, went to college, um, which was not as common back then, but she also left very early to marry George. Um, Did did that uh, affect her life in future times and her self-confidence, anything like that, or was it dismissed? So um, I wanted to see her high school records, and this required getting permission from her. So I, I asked her for permission, and she wrote a letter to the finishing sc- the prep school, kind of a finishing school she, she went to in South Carolina. She and Martha both went there um, and said, I fear she'll be unimpressed, but please give Susan Page access <laughs> to my school records. And what I found is that, that it, it had her IQ. I mean, I think that was a different time. I don't think we do that anymore. But her IQ was 120, which is a pretty good IQ. And her grades were terrible. <laughs> in high school, she got an A in exactly one subject, which was physical education. Wow. And only for one semester. Wow. She was like a B and C student uh, all the way. She was, I think, not an interested student. I think, you know, she was not, I think she just wasn't engaged in that. She went to Smith. Um, as did Nancy Reagan. She went a few years after Nancy Reagan. She went to Smith, but by this point she had met George Bush, and all she wanted to do was marry George exactly. Bush. And the, and the war started, and he went off to war, and she just, it was, her, she said that her, her poor father would have to call the dean uh, at Smith to try to explain why she was such a terrible student. <laughs> She's just so worried about her boyfriend who's, uh, you know, overseas. Um, but she she dropped out, and yeah. she never. I think she didn't regret it. Uh, you know, I think I think that was exactly what she wanted to do then. And mm-hmm. she was not someone I think who looked back and and had second thoughts about things. I think she's one of those people who kind of uh, plow ahead. I think we had time for one more question. Hi. Um, so my question is how about how you balance your role as a journalist and then your role as a human. Um, and when you, were <laughs> when you were going through these diaries and reading these really intimate things, w- were there just moments of deep emotion and did you feel you know, intimate um, like in relationship with, uh, with Barbara Bush? And was there anything that you considered maybe not putting in the book because of that? Good question. So, um, you know, I've been a journalist a long time. I've been a human even longer. <laughs> but, uh, I, I, I generally think of, and this may sound terrible, I just think of myself as a journalist first. Um, I mean, I think journalism is an obligation to your readers, especially when you're in, in Washington or elsewhere where you're covering things that are, you know, it's not, your obligation is not to be a human, it's to be a journalist. That said, there were many things in the diaries that I didn't use because the standard I tried to apply was, does this illuminate something about Barbara Bush? There were things in her diaries about other people that would have been very wounded to them that doesn't that didn't tell us anything about Barbara Bush. So I didn't use those. I didn't include those things. But the with the idea that there were things that uh, you know Barbara Bush probably wouldn't have wanted me to talk so much about her mother uh, or about how she worried about her self image. Um, but I viewed that. Not as a human, but as a journalist. 
Susan, one person you haven't talked about is Laura Bush and the relationship between her and Barbara Bush. How would you describe it? So I think Barbara Bush appreciated the fact that Laura Bush got her son on track. You know, George W. Bush had a time famously when he wasn't, didn't have a lot of purpose in life. And his marriage to Laura Welch really helped him find uh, his way, and especially when their, when their twin girls were born. Uh, and I think Barbara Bush appreciated that. Uh, Laura Bush was also, I think, deceptively strong. I mean, I think we think of Laura Bush as being um, very quiet and yeah. shy, and that is true, but she is also a very strong woman. And Laura Bush was willing to convey that to her mother-in-law in a way her mother-in-law, I think, came to respect. Um, and all of us with mother-in-laws may recognize this, uh, <laughs> this push and pull. Yeah. Um, but I think they, I think they came to an, a very respectful accommodation. And when I ask um, Barbara Bush, who had been the best first lady, she said, Laura. Uh, now, maybe that was huh. a family calculation, yeah. possibly, but that's what she said. I wonder, did you ask Laura the same question? <laughs> I, I did not. You did not. Well, you asked so many <laughs> other questions. I assure you, and I'm not the only one to say this, it's a fabulous book. I have... The newest issue of People Magazine, <laughs> which has a full page on Susan's book under the title, The Best New Books. So I want you all, really, it's a great book, Susan. Congratulations, and thank you for sharing your time. And thank you, Diane. Oh, I loved it. Thank you all for being here. Love it. Love it.